Well, welcome to Boulder Rotary, the best place to be on a Friday afternoon in Boulder, Colorado, or wherever you happen to be. That's the official bell to start the meeting. <laughs> and after that, I'd like to welcome Chad Stam, the president-elect, who will be leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance and the four-way test. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, and now if you'll uh, follow me with a four-way test. Of the things we think, say, and do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill or better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you so much, Chad. That was great. Um, so typically we meet at um, the, the Boulder Jewish Community Center on Arapahoe, and we are a club of over 220 people, and we provided service to our community for over 100 years. So we're a very proud club of uh, proud community leaders, and um, I know we will continue to do that despite all the adversary, adversary right now, and we will um, open opportunities for those around us. So to welcome the guests who are here today, if you have brought a guest, please encourage your guests to use the chat forum so they can introduce themselves to everybody. They can list who invited them today, what organization they are with, um, and I just wanted to say thank you to all of our guests today. I see that Gary Kahn brought a great big list of people who are rejoining us, and, um, and that is fabulous. Um, last week, I reached out to you to ask you if you hadn't been on a committee yet and you wanted to truly kind of get involved in Rotary to reach out to me. So thank you to those of you who did. And I just wanted to put it out there again. So if you send me an email, we can kind of brainstorm together on what, what committees might work well to spark a passion for you. The other thing I wanted to do today was to give you an update on polio. So Rotary has been working to end polio worldwide since 1986 and has partnered with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to make that happen. And I have some breaking news. Uh, we are now in the peak summer season with national immunization campaigns still sidelined by the COVID-19 pandemic. Immunizations are set to start back up in August, but the polio areas have substantially, substantially low levels of vaccination rates right now. The good news is that the new oral polio vaccine will um, no longer mutate to the contagious form. It is now ready for distribution. So that is wonderful breaking news. So with our new Rotary year, we have a new goal to meet, and that is $50 million to get to a $100 million match from the Gates Foundation. It is probably more important than ever to raise polio plus money this year. We are this close. As of July 8th, uh, Afghanistan had 29 cases of polio and Pakistan had 56 for a global total of 85 cases this year. We are this close. We just have to keep fighting. We're all very pleased that Dr. Don Berwick has joined us today. During his talk, please use the chat function on the right of your screen to write out any questions that you may have. A moderator will be collecting those questions and if your question is selected, you will be notified via chat. You will be then asked to present your question to Dr. Berwick. So again, welcome Dr. Berwick. We are most fortunate to have you here today and you're coming to us from Boston to share your unique insights and important perspectives about healthcare in this challenging times. Um, with COVID-19 challenging all of our assumptions about how our healthcare systems and our institutions can and should serve us. A pediatrician trained and affiliated with our nation's most prestigious academic medical institutions, Dr. Berwick is recognized worldwide as a leading authority on healthcare quality and improvement. He is president, president er Emeritus, Institute for Healthcare Improvement and former administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. He is the co-author and or author of over 160 scientific articles and six books. Awards for his contributions to healthcare at home and abroad are too numerous to mention. I'd like to point out one that um, one uh, 
board that makes Dr. Berwick really unique and that he was, uni he was knighted in 2005 for his work creating new care models in the UK for their National Health Service. So please welcome Sir Dr. <laughs> Berwick to the Boulder Rotary Club. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Sally. And uh, it's just a pleasure to see you all. And I want to thank uh, Gary for setting this up and uh, first uh, suggesting that I might join you. It's a real honor. And I happen to know you live in probably the most beautiful place in the nation. And I wish that the time had permitted for me to come out to you and uh, be there in person, because that would be such a pleasure for me. Um, I don't know much about the Boulder Rotary Club or what your uh, what, what unites you? I, I heard your pledge and and uh, and and your your promises. That sounds wonderful. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity just to reflect on my own uh, views about where we are now in the COVID-19 situation, and and to carry quite a f bit beyond that. I'm going to explain how, in the past um, really year or two, but certainly accelerated by the crisis we're in now, I've started to think a little more deeply about more moral issues. So I'm, I'm going to end up at a pretty high level, uh, hopefully not high minded, but um, a high level of conversation about what I think we need to do in this country. Now, the, the talk that I'm giving you was originally created for my colleagues in the healthcare world. And I know some of you are in healthcare, but by no means all of you. So there may be certain elements of it that speak more to clinicians and leaders of hospitals, uh, nurses and doctors. But, but I, I will really love to get your reflections on how this, um, this uh, kind of resonates with your own world, whatever that be. And I hope you'll push back hard on what I'm saying, because it's pretty edgy, but uh, I feel strongly about it. And I, and I, welcome, I welcome the dialogue and, and maybe the debate. Um, the... Um, the context of COVID-19 is where I'll start. I'm going to try to screen share and hopefully that will work. Uh, and you can tell me if it's working. Hold on one second here. Uh, can you see this? Uh, okay, Sally, is this the screen is sharing? Good news. Okay, so. Yes, it looks great. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with COVID-19, but and you'll see me broaden out uh, pretty fast. So, so here we are in, in really the greatest uh, global pandemic, certainly of my lifetime, the greatest, the biggest since 1918, uh, and a challenge to the healthcare system beyond anything I had ever imagined really was possible. Um, I can tell, talk more about the, the, con the context of that pandemic, and you may have questions about it. I, I try to be a student of it, but um, I was at, asked by the Journal of the American Medical, uh, Journal of the American Medical Association on, on whose uh, uh, oversight board I sit, uh, to write a paper. They said, would I write a paper on the new normal? That is what, what will emerging from COVID when we finally do be like. And I said, well, I really can't do that. I don't have a crystal ball. I, I, I don't know what the new normal will be. I know though that the COVID virus is uh, raising some uh, really interesting possibilities for us that I frame here as choices. I'll read you the first paragraph of here uh, of this paper for your interest. I wrote the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, has only 15 genes compared with 30,000 in the human genome, but it's a stern teacher indeed. Answers to the questions it has raised may reshape both healthcare and society as a whole. In this paper, I uh, went ahead and tried to define what I thought were six choices that the virus and, and the pandemic are presenting to us, not just by the way in this country, but this is a global issue. Uh, th these are the six I spoke about. Uh, the first was speed. In healthcare, there's a remarkably strong uh, set of ev evidence that uh, the, the time it takes for a really good innovation to become a standard, to become spread everywhere in healthcare is very long. There's a famous paper that everyone always quotes showing that when you look at at innovations at the, in, in the, at the bench and study when they get to the bedside, the average duration is 17 years. 17 years for a, between a good thing happening and it getting to most people. That's probably shorter than that, but that, was, that paper was, is quite famous. COVID changed that completely. The speed at which uh, healthcare systems are adapting and changing is light speed. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, my first wake-up call was several days after I first became aware of the coronavirus hitting the U.S., which was in Seattle. 
um, there was a group of Seattle intensive care doctors who um, reached out to Wuhan, China, to the intensive care doctors in Wuhan, to, just to debrief them, to say, what have you learned? What do you know that we need to know? Because this is coming to us now. And there resulted from that within a day, about a three or four page single spaced kind of memorandum of lessons from Wuhan. This wasn't in the published literature. This was just a bunch of docs getting together to do it. And that spread, that went, that went viral around the United States. I was on my desk within six hours of that contact between Wuhan and, and um, Seattle. There's a famous story in England, where as, as you've heard, I, I've worked quite a bit. Uh, the British National Health Service uh, feared the surge that, that was headed for the UK. And so what they did is they took a conference center, the Excel Center, which is an enormous conference center in East London, and decided to convert it to a 2,900 bed intensive care unit. It took them three weeks from thinking of the idea to admitting the first patient. It turned out, by the way, they, they didn't need those many beds. They, they, they coped far better with the, system, with the surge than they thought, but that's still there in waiting for a next surge. Uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association the, the, that I sit on the board of <coughs> turnaround times for papers are, are in hours now, where normally they'd be weeks. This, the the um, Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Medicine, uh, which takes ye years to do studies, uh, set up a, a standing committee on the coronavirus and on emerging infections. Uh, I sit on that committee. Within one month, that committee had published 11 uh, important reports on dealing with the coronavirus. So, so speed, speed is here. Do we want to keep it? Would we like to be able to learn and act with the tempo that this crisis is allowing us to do, causing us to do globally, not just in the U.S.? The second is about standardization. You and the Rotary Club, except for the clinicians, you probably don't realize how variable healthcare is around just around the United States, around from zip code to zip code. Behaviors of physicians and nurses uh, and hospitals differ enormously. We have evidence of rates of variation in surgery, surgery like hysterectomies and prostatectomies uh, that vary two or three or 400%, just depending on where you live. Uh, this We've known this a long time, but that kind of variation is a problem in American medicine. And we've been there's sort of a tension. The physicians arguably, uh, and for good reason, argue for um, autonomy. You know, I'm the doctor, I'll decide. Don't, don't give me a cookbook. Uh, and meanwhile, the science is producing these, I guess, cookbooks, like what's the best way to treat a migraine headache? Or when do you do surgery on, such, on, on, a, on a particular challenge? And we've had tension in that. That's shifted. COVID is um, remarkable in that the, 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 the clinical systems are reaching out all over the world for standards. They're, they're asking, what is the right way to do this? How do I manage the ventilator? Do I use uh, hydroxychloroquine? What about using dexamethasone? How about uh, proning patients on ventilators? Over and over again, we're seeing this search for standards that really matter, scientific standards. It's pretty interesting. Will we keep it or toss it? Are we going to go back after COVID to everyone play it their own way? Or are we going to say, you know, science is not a bad reference point for deciding what we're going to do the same way. That's controversial because it threatens physicians. They say, well, wait a minute, I don't want handcuffs on. I want to be able to actually make the decision for my patient that I think is best. The third is the explosion of virtual care. Maybe you're getting virtual care. I am. Next week, I have a clinical appointment that's been switched to a virtual one. I was supposed to go to the hospital and doctor's office. I won't. I'm going to be on, as I am with you, on Zoom. Uh, I spoke to a, a community health center uh, leader last week who's, who went from 5% virtual visits to 95% virtual visits in one week. Uh, it's, it, I've never seen a shift like this, and it is better. It looks better. The evidence we have so far is for a tremendous number of needs. The virtual visit is faster, less expensive, more agile, uh, more convenient, and higher quality, or at least the same. This raises another question, which is really edgy, which is, as you may have read in the newspapers, a lot of normal care is not happening. People aren't showing up. And they're not showing up with heart attacks, with uh, pneumonias, with things we thought were ambient in the community. And we don't know yet why. Is it that they didn't really need to show up and actually healthcare was overproducing visits? Or are they doing just, or are they doing badly? And, and we'll, we're gonna get the answer to that. What's gonna happen is we're gonna begin to realize a lot of the care we give actually isn't necessary. You can skip it. Uh, I, at the risk of offending some of my colleague physicians on the phone, I'll tell you the evidence behind an annual checkup is very, very poor. And uh, we probably waste a lot of time in annual visits for people that don't need them 
denying the clinicians time to spend with the people who really do. That COVID's going to raise that question. The next is workforce protection, and that has to do with both pr protective equipment. We fell way behind. We're still on our heels, by the way. There are a lot of people seeing patients without protective equipment. Tremendous breakdown in the national supply chain. Uh, but in addition, there's another level of protection, which has to do with, uh, with um, lower income members of the healthcare workforce. You may not know it, but 1.4 million healthcare workers get paid so little that they're on Medicaid. There are 1.2 million healthcare workers who have no health insurance at all. We have an, a kind of underclass in healthcare. We've not attended to them. We've allowed this, I think, injustice to persist in the system. And so there's an, another workforce issues. We start to applaud the people cleaning the rooms and, and serving the food in the cafeterias and, and doing the work that supports the clinical workforce. Maybe we ought to do better by them. Uh, the fifth issue I raised is about preparedness itself. I'm not going to go deeply into that, but as you know, this country, although we were interestingly scored high for preparedness by the World Health Organization and others, we weren't. We aren't. We still aren't. We don't have a plan for testing. We don't have a plan for case finding and tracking. We don't have a plan for deployment of a vaccine when and if a vaccine arrives. We didn't have a plan for staffing. We didn't have a plan for regionalization of data. We were way, way, way behind, and it, it frankly killed people. We have tens of thousands of people. We're up now over 130,000 deaths in this country, and a surprisingly large number of those probably could have been averted if we had acted more quickly, as many other countries in the planet did. They were, they were better prepared, and they were able to act more quickly. So that we're going to raise questions about public health and readiness now out of COVID. The last is what I'm going to spend the rest of my time on, and it is inequity, inequality. COVID has revealed, it has underscored what we knew all along. We've had data in health services research for decades, if not a century, about racial inequalities in healthcare and health. They are also socioeconomic, but they are also independently racist. And we've seen it in the data. Uh, death rates in African Americans in our COVID epidemic in this country, three times whites. For Latinos, it's 2.4 times, depending on which tranche of data you take. Um, this, this virus is asymmetrically very difficult for African Americans and Latin and, and people of color in general. Now, uh, the why is what I'm going to talk about a little bit more, because this is not new. It's not news. It, COVID happened, but if you'd asked me four years ago when a pandemic arrives, what's going to happen, I would have told you, uh, because we have plenty of information. We've had this problem for a long time. Uh, why is it there? Well, the, uh, the scholarship behind inequity in health status is deep and, and broad. One of the great scholars in the field is Sir Michael Marmot, a, a British uh, epidemiologist who wrote a book, which if you're looking for a book to read, I would say try Sir Michael Marmot's book. It's called The Health Gap. It was written in, in 2015, and it's about inequity in outcomes. Uh, why do blacks have much more morbidity than whites? Why do poor people die sooner than, than rich people? Why, why do uh, children of color have much, much more chronic illness than children, uh, than majority children in this country and in other countries? Now, Michael um, traces it all to inequities, to inequalities. Now, it's a, it's a, it's a little... Um, it's a little more subtle than that. I'm going to take you a little deeper into the, this nature of this inequity, but let, let, me, let me show you some things. This is the healthcare data I just showed you. We're unequal inside healthcare. 1.1 million kids and 800,000 healthcare workers live in poverty. They're, they live below the poverty line in the United States. These are healthcare workers, they're employed. Uh, the the uh, 10 percent are in so little they get health care through Medicaid and 1.4 million have no health insurance at all. So we, we, we inequity is not something that lies out there from the point of view of the health care system. It's deeply embedded even in our health care system. Now, Marmot explores these inequities. Why why would people be so much sicker when they're poorer or of color? And, and the answer is has a kind of wonky name. We call it social determinants of health. That's the term that's used in the scientific fields. Um, and there, are, Marmot particularly outlined six of them. Uh, the, here's where the evidence is extremely strong. It begins in early childhood. The experiences of kids around birthing, uh, bonding, early, uh, early childhood supports. Uh, people of color and people in 
poverty have um, a much higher rate of um, problems with supports to, to early childhood. And this echoes down through adulthood. Uh, there's an index uh, called, the, um, called the Adverse Childhood Experience, the ACE index, A-C-E, which is simply a count of the number of exposures kids have to really serious stresses, violence in their communities, um, food insecurity, and so on. Kids that have four or more ACEs have something like two or three times the rate of heart disease when they become adults. The same for lung cancer. They have 14 times the risk of having problems with substance abuse. Early childhood is shapes us, it's, it's a shaper. Now countries that invest in redistributional tax policy, that in other words, take money from the wealthier people and put it to the service of people at the lower end of the spectrum, can sometimes virtually erase these inequities in childhood experiences. This is a matter of solidarity in communities as to whether we who have the resources reach across to those who do not to correct this. The same plays out in the education world. Uh, people at the lower end of educational achievement have much higher morbidity and much lower life expectancy than people at the higher end of educational achievement. That also can be erased. Countries that have progressive financing tax and social service policies erase the relationship between educational level and longevity. The work in the workplace matters, uh, uh, both salary levels and also uh, uh, meaning in work, workplaces where there's protection of workers against being uh, exploited. So experiences of elders matter. Uh, communities that have good infrastructure for elder care actually have longer life expectancy overall. And then there's this category number five, community resilience. If you want to predict uh, the life expectancy in a community, look at things about the community like its transportation system, its uh, food security, uh, environmental threats, uh, parklands, uh, housing adequacy, because those properties of communities predict lifespan in the communities. And that leads to Marmot's sixth category, he calls it fairness. It's a commitment to equity. Inequ inequities in power, money, and resources give rise to inequities in the conditions of daily life, which in turn lead to inequities in health. That's Marmot's conclusion. Now, let me show you how this plays out uh, in data. And we're going to come back to COVID in a, in a, in a minute or two. Uh, this is the subway map for London. Uh, and what I'm going to show you is called in the epidemiologic community a subway map. So I, I've circled for you here uh, the subway stop in Oxford Circus. It's a very wealthy part of London. 96, 96 is the average life expectancy of people who live in the immediate neighborhood of Oxford Circus, a very wealthy place. In East London, uh, it's much poorer. Uh, this is uh, Star Lane in East London, which is a poorer part of the city. Life expectancy is 75 years, 96, 75. That is a 21 year difference in life expectancy, simply depending on where you live. If you take the London tube, the subway, from Oxford Circus to Star Lane, you lose 8.4 months of lifespan for every minute you're on the London Tube on the subway. It's 2.6 years of life loss per mile traveled. We have these data for city after city. Here's, here's New York, New York City. Uh, there is um, the area of uh, Midtown Manhattan, wealthy area. This is a uh, you know, 80, 85th and 96th Street stop. Uh, here, life expectancy is about 85 years, same as it is in Japan. Average income is about $180,000. Uh, people are mostly not; they're mostly white, and they uh, their kids are are uh, well dressed and in good schools. This is the South Bronx, a very heavily troubled part of New York City, uh, where life expectancy is 10 years lower. Uh, income is only 25% of what it is on average in this part in, in Midtown Manhattan. Um, uh, on that subway ride on the D train in, uh, in, uh, in, in New York, uh, the, you lose uh, six months for every uh, minute you're on the subway, two and a half years, 2.3 years per mile life expectancy difference of 10 years. These differences are massive. And I, I, I wanted to give you a sense of what this place-based health status number is like. You lose six months for every minute on the subway in that D, on that D train in New York. Now let's compare um, 
that to healthcare. Uh, this is a, I don't know how many of you are on statins. I, I won't ask you, it's your private information, but it's one of the most widely used drugs in the, in the country. Statins lower your cholesterol and it's a bit controversial. They, they may, we're not totally sure, but they may prevent some heart attacks and some deaths. And there's a lot of literature on this, which varies, but there was a summary, which I grabbed here from the British Medical Journal uh, some um, years ago, a couple of years ago. And it said that on average, when they reviewed all of the statin studies, they said death was postponed between minus five and 19 days uh, in primary prevention, that is if you don't already have heart disease, and between minus 10 and 27 days in secondary prevention trials. Overall, the, 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 most, favorable, the most favorable result found is that for a year on statins, you save approximately one day of life. Uh, for 20 years on statins, you lay, save 20 days of life. Um, that, uh, let me see, 20 days of lifespan, uh, which is the, the benefit of taking statins, a miracle drug for 20 years, is how much lifespan you lose riding the D train in New York for seven seconds. In Glasgow, Scotland, where the first uh, subway map ever was drawn, uh, riding the Glasgow bus for 43 feet uh, lowers your life expectancy uh, as much as statins adds life expectancy in 20 years. This plays out in real serious forms of inequity in American life. This is uh, for men, life expectancy starting at age, um, age uh, I think that's 50, for, depending on year of birth. So here were men born in 1920, men born in 1930, men born in 1940, men born in 1950. And steadily over time, you can see that the poorest 10% made almost no gain in life expectancy at, during this 30 year period of birth. Men who were born in 1950 are now of course, 70, 79 years of age. Um, people at the top end of the income spectrum made substantial gains in life expectancy. For women, it's even a more interesting result. The poorest women in the United States lost life expectancy during this 30 year period of development, uh, substantial a lot, loss of life expectancy compared to those at the top of the income ladder. So the, um, the, the social determinants of health we're talking about, early childhood experiences, education, workplace, uh, community resilience, care of elders, fairness, are massive, massive uh, determinants of health status and longevity compared to anything healthcare does anywhere for almost anyone. Healthcare, in essence, is running a tremendously expensive repair shop. We're spending three, tr three and a half trillion dollars, eighteen percent of our gross domestic product, repairing damage done by that list of social determinants in large measure. Genetics does have an effect, but the social determinants are at least forty, probably fifty percent of the variation in health status in our country. So um, we have to cast our eyes in a slightly different direction to 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 wind this up into a package. Uh, this of course is the, is the tragedy of the murder of George Floyd. Uh, something that seems to have woken the country up uh, at a level I haven't seen since my days in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. I don't know if, if this uh, new awareness of the depth and, and toxicity of institutional racism, structural racism in the United States is gonna lead to anything any real change. I think a lot of that depends on this election cycle, frankly, but we are, um, we are in a country in which we've allowed social determinants, including one's race, to be the determinant of lifespan, opportunity, and well-being. Now, thinking this through has led me to a place that I feel uncomfortable about, but it is what I wanna share with you in the final minutes of my initial presentation to you. So these things that I showed you from Michael Marmot, uh, the effect of early childhood on well-being, uh, the uh, consequences of workplace conditions, the uh, conditions of education and the relationship to health, uh, the, the basic driver of poverty as an underlying uh, cause of tremendous inequality in life expectancy and health status, and racism itself, the heritage of slavery. Uh, we've this is all known. These are, this is known for decades. As a medical student, I took courses in which people lectured about these social determinants. 
And to, to be pretty accurate and pretty, uh, make a pretty bold summary statement is we haven't done anything about it. We haven't done anything about it. Nothing that's really worked. Not if our goal is health as a society, not for the people who are more disadvantaged in our society. We continue to have run the repair shop uh, on and dime in a large city. We'll spend uh, half a billion dollars building a brand new hospital tower. We'll, we'll add to our catheter suites in our hospitals. We will, uh, we will do more surgeries and celebrate it. Uh, but the underlying causes remain unaddressed and according to a lot of the data continually worsening. And as a physician now approaching the end of my career, I keep, I'm now at a point where I'm saying, well, why? Why? What is, what is stopping us? We're a compassionate country, supposedly. We, we're, we're a wealthy country, definitely. We spend more double any other country's budget on health care. Where is the investment in the social conditions that underlie the inequities and disease and outcomes in our, in our country? Where is the investment in those subway maps and reversing that? Now, as I said, the original talk I'm giving you was uh, in December, I gave to a very large healthcare audience and I was saying, well, you know what? I think we better take responsibility. And by we, I mean healthcare in this case. Uh, most healthcare people would say, well, I, I am in the repair shop. I'll fix people when they come to me. And I'm not responsible for George Floyd's death. I'm not responsible for the fact that uh, a million healthcare workers have no health insurance at all. I'm not responsible for failures uh, to protect our children in the early years of their lives. I'm not responsible for unequal income distribution that leads to toxicity. And I'm making it. I'm making a counter argument. I'm saying, yes, you are. You can't occupy 18% of the gross domestic product and take a pass on the underlying determinants of health and well-being. Now, speaking of the Boulder Club of Rodeo, uh, or the, Bold, the, the Rotary Club of Boulder, I, I don't know. I don't know Boulder. I don't know the socioeconomics. I know Colorado. I know that Den I could have shown you the subway map for Denver, in effect, and it would pretty much look the same. I know the inequ inequity is there. I know the racism is there. And I guess I'm, I'm starting to think that we, and by we, I mean healthcare, but I also mean we, the, the citizenry in our own corporate locations, we've got to start to take responsibility for this. So we are, we are surrendering to a level of inequity and suffering in our country that is avoidable. So I put out a, a, a call for a campaign in healthcare in December. I, I don't, it, I, I know it feels a little crazy, maybe it is, but Here's stuff that we would do if we, if we in healthcare or you in whatever industry you in said, we're, we're going to fix this. Enough is enough. We're going to stop admiring the problem, as they say in the military, and actually fix it. Here are the seven steps I could think of for starters. One is we would insist that the U.S. ratify major human rights treaties in the, in the international community. We remain aside. We have not, the United States alone among democracies, has failed to ratify major human rights treaties in the UN system. Treaties protecting migrant workers, treaties protecting women, pr treaties protecting children, uh, conventions on human rights. We're not there, we need to go there. Second, among those conventions is the International Declaration on Human Rights, which includes healthcare as a human right in our nation. Let's be clear, healthcare is not yet a human right in our nation. There are over 30 million people who have no insurance at all, there are 50 to 60 million whose insurance is totally inadequate to their needs. And I believe it is time, no matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, no matter what you believe in terms of the role of markets or not, we, I say we should call the question and make healthcare a human right in our nation. Third, uh, our abandonment of leadership in climate change is a terrible insult to health and the planet. We have not even begun to see the dramatic effects that are gonna occur with climate dislocation, refugee, climate refugees, climate warfare, climate zoonoses. And uh, I believe in this case, I was speaking to the American healthcare community, we need to say, no, stop it. Climate change and our role in climate change is severe and we need to take that leadership back. Fourth is our criminal justice system. We have 2.4 million people in our prisons and jails. We have nearly double the rate of uh, incarceration in our country that Russia does. 
Uh, no country on earth is close to us in our incarceration rate per capita, and it is racial. Uh, blacks are incarcerated at seven times the rate of whites, five, uh, Hispanics, Latinos at five times the rate of whites. It is the new Jim Crow, to quote Michelle Alexander's amazing book. Uh, it, is, it is the current version of racism. Uh, the criminal justice system is used in our country to, as an as a, um, effector arm for racist activity. Now, I'm not saying there aren't criminals. I'm not saying we don't need a criminal justice system. We do, but it needs to be a justice system, not a punishment system. And we have remarkable models in this country and around the world for reform criminal justice systems that work. They work on, avoid, on alternatives to incarceration, on incarceration systems that actually are healing, and on very careful supports to people returning from incarceration back to the community. And I'm urging the American healthcare community to take this on. 70% of the people in our, in our jails and prisons in this country have substance abuse or mental health problems. It is a health problem. Fifth, uh, I am sick and tired. I've had it up to here with the way we're treating uh, people at our Southern border, kids and families whose sin is that they wanna be in our country. Uh, we need compassion and immigration reform, and, and we need a public that's aroused because Congress has been unable to get there. Uh, the sixth is about hunger and homelessness. The current data say that there are about 40 million people in the United States who, are, who have food insecurity, uh, hunger, uh, and there are at least 600,000 chronically homeless people in our country. Uh, it should be zero. We have the wealth and the uh, capacity in our country to end hunger and end homelessness. And I say that is a commitment we should make. Finally, all of this activity depends on soundness of democratic institutions and those are currently eroded. Science has been eroded or damaged in very important agencies in our federal administrative system that depend on science to do the work properly. Uh, the idea that a, a heroic figure in American medicine, probably of the century, Dr. Anthony Fauci, would suffer indignities uh, at the hands of executive leaders in our country to me is, it's unacceptable. It, it undercuts the basic commitment to facts, data, and science in this pursuit of well-being for people. And to me, that all also traces to uh, voting equality and uh, standing up against uh, 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 things that limit people's ability to vote. That includes the Electoral College. Uh, in the Electoral College today, uh, uh, people who vote in a, in a small rural state, their vote counts 70 times as much as a citizen in an urban environment, uh, in an uh, urban state in our country. And that's not the only kind of voter suppression that's going on. Now, these don't look like a healthcare list. They're a list for, they're a social reform list, a moral reform list. And I think these have to do with the underlying charter of the nation. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's out of reach, uh, but I think an activated healthcare system for starters, and maybe people like you uh, could say enough, enough. These problems are not worthy of a country as wealthy and compassionate and as, as a, uh, formally committed to justice and equality as we are. I will um, leave it there. I, I hope that it will provoke some conversation and I thank you again for the chance to share these thoughts with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Berwick. We really appreciate it. That was an incredible talk. Uh, I'd like to open the floor now for questions. Uh, our first one comes from Susan Buchanan about missteps. Susan? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Berwick, for your comments. I worked in the uh, nonprofit healthcare field for 20 years, so uh, had too much time to observe the inequities and uh, being handcuffed to providing the best care that we possibly could, although I think we did a pretty good job. But my question for you is, whether you think that the Affordable Care Act had any appreciable effect on the quality or access to health care in this country. Uh, thank you, Susan. I also, you, I, I believe you put in another question also, did you not, about speed of change? Uh, they, they, they said I could only ask one. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat on your behalf. <laughs> uh, I'll do that one first, the speed of change. Yes, and when we move as fast as we are now, you know, testing drugs, trying new ways to use a ventilator, uh, trying new approaches to antibiosis, 
there is a risk. We can be, we can, we can, um, we can do harm by mistake, but there are ways to do that. I, my field is quality improvement. And by the way, there's been great work on quality improvement in the, in the, in Colorado, real leading state in that. And so as long as you use the methods of improvement in which you take steps and instantly reflect on what happened, you learned from every patient, you make, make the system transparent. Uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. You can, uh, you can do this kind of change at pace and learn constantly. And I can give you more examples of that. Well, the Affordable Care Act, as you know, I'm not a, I'm not a trustworthy respondent. I, I was the administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services <laughs> under the Obama administration for the first year and a half of the Affordable Care Act. So I, I took, I was, I led the implementation for about 70% of the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. I think it's on the whole a success. Uh, it doesn't go as far as I wish it would. I have publicly uh, stated my support for a single payer system. I, I believe the country would be better off with a national a single national health insurance system, basically, as if I'm, I'm on Medicare. I don't. I, I don't. I may get COVID, and I'm worried about that. But I don't have to worry about money in COVID because I'm, I've got insurance. Uh, and there are 30 million people that don't now. Another four and a half million lost their insurance when they lost their jobs just in the past three months. Mm -hmm. No other country tolerates that. The Affordable Care Act worked upstream against that, and so it provided more coverage. About 20. About 22 million or 23 million more people got coverage thanks to the Affordable Care Act, uh, and coverage got better for everybody else. We we put in the Affordable Care Act puts in prevention benefits that were never there before. It put in a limit uh, uh, mandatory components of health insurance, so you can't get junk health insurance plans. That you've got to have 10 essential benefits. So when you buy the insurance, you know it's going to be there. Uh, more transparency. Um, Unfortunately, the current administration has eroded that. We, are, we, we, we reached our peak in coverage in 2016, the year uh, that President Trump took over, and it's gone steadily down since then due to maneuvers that the federal government is engaged in. And, and um, people are now in the COVID epidemic, they're having a lot of trouble getting insurance uh, due to uh, barriers and lack of uh, supports that the administration has given. That we could reverse that. The Affordable Care Act did. On quality, interesting, about, there were 10 titles in the Affordable Care Act. Five of them were about quality improvement. They were things like, there was a whole bunch of, of, of stuff in the Affordable Care Act to allow, to help patients who were in hospitals or in institutions get home with home and community-based services. It was a thrilling part of the plan. And we had hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people able to go back to their communities because of the affordable care Act. there was some very important support to national collaborative work on hospital complications the data are controversial but it looks like we had about uh i'm going to say a 20 percent 17 to 20 percent reduction in hospital complication rates at least during the period of time the affordable care Act was working on that because we were helping hospitals to work on complications. And also there were financial incentives, hospitals that got their rates down, they actually got some bonuses. And I think that was probably a good idea, although there's some edges when you do bonuses like that. Um, there was very strong investment in um, innovation. The Affordable Care Act said at the center set up, or I got to set up the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which was a $10 billion center to support innovations in coverage and delivery all over the United States, an outpouring of local innovations that was, uh, I thought, quite stunning. So yeah, I, it, it made progress. It, it, it partial progress. There, there's much, much more we could do and I think should do in this country in addition to tackling some of the social determinants that I just talked about. I hope, Susan, that answers your question. Thank you, Susan. Uh, next is Bill Anderson. Thank you, Dr. Berwick. Uh, what a fascinating discussion. Uh, the question that I had was <clears throat> relating to uh, life expectancy. Uh, the pandemic has highlighted disparate healthcare outcomes in minority communities. Uh, African American life expectancy, according to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, is <clears throat> more than three and a half years shorter than the average American. But interestingly, that data suggests that. Hispanic life expectancy and Asian life expectancy exceeds the average in the United States. And I wonder how you account for that difference in the numbers. Well, of course, the, uh, the, those are overall summary numbers. When you look at the texture, say within cities or between in, in areas of poverty or not, the, the things are quite flipped, they're quite reversed and the disparities are, are much greater. I don't have an explanation that I'm I, I, that I am sure about. I know that for uh, that, that the heritage of slavery itself, which is a uh, black 
uh, burden. It's an African American burden in this country. It ha continues to work through levels of structural inequality and racism that are very, very deeply embedded in society. Now, I'm not saying Latino and Asian Americans are not facing somewhat the same thing, but there's a different level of duration of that burden. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with, with the socioeconomic status that people find themselves in, and the poverty rates are very, very high in the, in, in the in communities of color. Uh, the one other thing you didn't mention, which I, I, I wanna add to your list, Bill, is uh, Native Americans. Uh, all of the numbers we're looking at are worse for Native Americans also, especially uh, uh, both urban and, and, um, and those in Indian country. Uh, I find this, uh, that should have been on my list of uh, the moral determinants that we, we are tolerating. There are 40%, 40% of the people who live on Navajo reservation don't have clean water. Um, we, you know, we have these levels of, of uh, abandonment of duties uh, and tribal and uh, treaty obligations to Native Americans that are playing out in very, very bad health status. Thank you, uh, Bill, and thank you, Don. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, John, John Sullivan, can you unmute and ask your question? Yes, I can. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Berwick. I had a question, and it was about the list of uh, social determinants of health. And why aren't things like regular exercise and good nutrition included on that list? They, they are included, sir. It's, um, it, uh, what Marmot does is analyze the availability of these as structural properties of communities. So his whole category of community resilience has to do with food security and food opportunities in, um, in, uh, depending on, on the wealth and, and equity across communities. Uh, I've, I've been on Navajo uh, reservation in, in uh, last year, and it's really hard to find fresh vegetables. For example, the, the structurally, the place isn't set up for it. There, there are there are uh, vendors, there are stores that don't have electricity. They, they don't have refrigeration, and so that's that's there's a, there's a nexus of connection between the structural components of uh, cities and uh, of communities and what you're talking about. Uh, for to have uh, exercise patterns and walkability requires urban design in cities that's supportive with parks and recreational facilities. If you look at the, which really goes back to redlining in the cities, but you look at American cities and you study whether depending on your race or your wealth, whether, what kind of access you have to recreational facilities, it varies a lot. Now, I, I know part of your question has to do with kind of health literacy, and I'm, I don't mean to gainsay that. I'm a pediatrician and I understand that we do, don't do a very good job in helping people understand what they really can do to support their health and well-being. So I, it's not a pure thing, but there is a relationship between poverty and disadvantage on the one hand and the opportunity to live healthy lifestyles on the other. Thank you. And Don, I, I, I want you to know we have a project to bring, a, a large project that our club is very proud of bringing clean water to the Lakota Sioux up in Pine Ridge. Thank you. Pine Ridge is such, I mean, it's a, it's a test case, you know, the, 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 the conditions in Pine Ridge are such that if we set about to say, you know, with, with the kind of compassion, your four, what do you call it, the four ways or four part? Four way test, yes. Take the four way test to Pine Ridge and apply it and we would behave differently. Uh, than our country does. Thank you for doing that, Gary. Uh, by the way, um, th there's a professor, is it Willem von Flight? Yes. Who sent me a remarkable email yesterday with an attached um, uh, essay that I, I didn't know about. It was from the Boston Review. It's something that I would re recommend to anyone to read, but it talks about a mobilization of, 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 in that case, clinicians, physicians and nurses and others toward a kind of solidarity to tackle what we're talking about, just like you're saying, you're helping Pine Ridge, Gary. I don't know if, if, if Professor Fun Flight's on the- on Yes, the, he's, uh, he's, he happens to be a guest today and he's up next for a question. Great, okay. <laughs> I uh, look forward to listening to him. Yeah, Gary, thank you for, uh, for inviting me and this opportunity and Dr. Berwick, uh, many thanks for your, your thoughtful comments and I'd almost say keep on talking because you begin to address the very point that I wanted to, to raise. And if I were to, uh, to couch it in the form of a question in relation to inequity, uh, I think my question would be if you can comment 
on the relationship between the need for an individual's responsibility in the sense of ability to respond uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the need for collective action given the weight of established institutional forces whose chief interests are in maintaining power and making profits. It's a, uh, a short question and I'm afraid uh, uh, a lot more time is needed to address it, but in the available time, uh, if you could begin to speak to this, uh, I'd, I'd be very grateful. Thank you, Professor Van Flatter. I, mean, I, I welcome your thoughts about it too. Um, let me, um, okay, there, there, I, think the, I think one should take your question at two levels. Qu level one is, uh, it, what, it, what can an individual do, a single person? We just heard Gary talk about reaching out to Pine Ridge. That's a courageous and very important thing to do. I think as every single person in the country who cares about the, the disparities we're talking about, there are, you can speak out. Just, just the fact the Boulder Club, uh, the Rotary Club of Boulder is willing to talk about it. That's, that's progress. That means we get a chance to put our heads together about it. You can speak. You can write. Uh, Willem sent me this um, remarkable essay. We write op-eds. You can, you can put pen to paper and talk about this. Uh, you, can, you can work. There, it, it, there isn't a city or community in the United States where there isn't some organization working on just about everything we just talked about. There are amazing organizations in this country trying to work on criminal justice reform. You can connect to them as an individual. Go to work with them uh, as, as a citizen. And most importantly, you can vote. We've got to start voting for leaders who embrace the goal of justice. I, I don't know another, another way to say it. And the turnout rates in this country are abysmal. They're embarrassing. And I think this is a, certainly this cycle is one where universal voting is key. I think I can address uh, Billum's other point best by, by screen sharing again. Uh, there is, there is, it's a very edgy thing. And I, I don't know your politics in the Rotary Club. Or you, I may be talking to a, quite a Republican group. I, I really don't know. But um, there is, there is uh, an inescapable matter here of redistribution of, well, of wealth. Sick people are poorer, poor people are sicker. People of disadvantage are of disadvantage. And the concentration of money is aligned with the concentration of opportunity. So whatever side of the aisle you're on, if you want a healthy community, we're going to have to take resources and move them from people who have a lot to people who have far less and, and build those infrastructures we're talking about. I, I want to show you a, a slide that, that uh, this, uh, I don't know, maybe you already know this, but this has to do, oops, sorry, um, showing you my emails. Okay, here is a slide that summarizes effective tax rates in the United States in the period 1962 to 2018. This is what tax policy is in the United States right now. For the bottom 50% of income earners in the United States, their effective tax rate has gone up in this, what is that, 58, 54 years, from 22.5 to 24.2%. For the middle 40%, uh, from 25% to 27%. For the richest 400 people in this country, their tax rate in this period of time fell from 54% to 23. For the top 1%, from 51 to 31. For the top 10%, from 43 to 31. Uh, excuse me, from 33 to 29. This is regressive distribution of wealth. This is, this is exactly the opposite. It's concentrating wealth in the country instead of using our wealth to reach out to provide some of the infrastructures and schools and early childhood experiences and workplace conditions and elder care and roads and, and bridges and, and parks and food security that we're talking about. And it, it's, it's wrong policy. I, I think it's wrong policy whether you're uh, on the right or on the left because it, it, it builds an unhealthy country. So that's my view of the collective responsibility, Willem, and it begins with that commitment. Thank you, Don. Um, I think we have, we have one more question uh, and then we'll uh, have our responder, uh, Hans Wick. Uh, George Russell, you had a question? Yes, 
my my uh, daughter is worried about schools. I know a lot of pediatricians say kids are not a big transfer uh, mechanism. What are your thoughts on that? Would you let your grandchildren go to school? I have seven grandchildren, and the answer is yes right now, uh, but only under uh, certain conditions. Ms. Russell, so the, here's, the, here's the thing. Um, it, it demands a lot of the public to have a kind of a mature, uh, balanced view of the situation. The answer to Mr. Russell's question is we don't know. We really don't know. The data are not in. We, the COVID's only been around since January. So we, we, don't, we don't have that long a history of data collection about this particular bug. We're getting it fast. You know, uh, Supporting the scientific community to gather information is, is very important, which is why undercutting CDC and what, I mean, this craziness withdrawing from WHO. I just, it, it boggles my mind. We need the science. So at the moment, where we are now is we know that not being in school is really hurting a lot of kids. That's very, very difficult. It's hurting a lot of families, especially lower income families who can't afford the childcare and they're forced to choose between childcare and work. So there's real, real good reasons to say, look, let's try to get kids back into the, into the schools that, that, are, that are there for them. The evidence so far is that for young children, spread from young kids to adults seems very rare. Most kids who are very young, who carry the virus, and there are a lot of them, don't seem to spread that virus to adults at anything like a high rate. Now that may prove not to be true. We're gonna, we're gonna find out as we go along. But I think if we open the schools uh, with, with clever ways to distance kids from each other, to wear masks, to maybe stagger participation so not all the kids are in the school at the same time, to develop. Another idea is very interesting, to develop bubbles so the same kids are always with the same kids, which will, of course, spread, uh, decrease spread from group to group. I think, it's, I think we should go ahead and try it. That's my current view, given the current data. So did the American Academy of Pediatrics. They've taken a stand on this, and I think they've been quite courageous about that. And the National Academy of Medicine uh, is about, I believe, to issue a number of very strongly thought through uh, uh, positions on this. Now, Mr. Russell, I think that the other thing you've got to understand is we're, we're not sure that's right. And, and we're going to learn as we go. And so the other part of this is really support data collection and the public health system. So the minute we start to see difficulty form, we can say, hold it, everybody pause. We got to take a step back here. That's the only way to get back to safety here. But the answer for my seven grandchildren is yes. I think they're all going to be back in school unless a whole new wave hits the entire country. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll watch it from then on. I think the kids themselves are not that much at risk, by the way. The, the form of this disease in kids is generally pretty mild. There, are, there is a very rare, extremely serious form of the disease, but it's extremely rare. And, and uh, doesn't, it doesn't worry me at, at, a, at a statistical level right now, although obviously it's a tragedy for any kid that that happens to. How many grandkids do you have, George? Two. Just two. How, how old are they? Uh, nine and seven. So they're still young enough that they're in the rather more protected age group <clears throat> as opposed yeah. to older teenagers. Yeah. Hans. Thank you. Now I'd like to go ahead. So thank you, Dr. Berwick, uh, for just a <clears throat> wonderful thought provoking presentation. Uh, I can tell you uh, just from a couple of uh, asides here that uh, I've got two grandchildren as well. And I've been in uh, not-for-profit healthcare for over 40 years and actually have had the privilege of attending many of your IHI conferences when I was a hospital CEO in Orlando. And I thank you so much for your leadership in terms of the attendance and the work that you've done in the improvement of, for both the quality and, and improving the health and quality of our U.S. citizens and across the world. So it's just a great privilege to have you presenting to our club. I'd also Can I just ask you, what, what hospital window were you CEO of? Uh, not in Orlando. I just went to your conferences in Orlando. Oh, in conference in Orlando. Go, yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. I'm the CEO please. in California and Oregon and here in Colorado. So Great. I've seen a lot of perspective. And I, I'm also a public health guy that been for 40 years. And I've always understood that public health is where we have to be in social determinants of health. And to your campaign imperatives at the end, I would also submit that when we look at Rotary and Rotary International and Rotary, our Rotary clubs around the planet, including our own, 
a lot of those things resonate clearly what Rotary is all about. We really do want to make a difference in our communities in the world, whether it's in climate, whether it's in the education of our kids, and just the safety of what we want to provide for our future generations. So we applaud you for those, that thinking and, and thinking that we are on the right track. I would also uh, comment just on the stock of inequities and just listening to you is to say, the other part of this I would also add is the fact that we all pay for those inequities. You know and I know that when our system falls apart, they end up in expensive places, whether in jail or in hospitals. We all pay for that. And so if we want to solve this problem, there's an ROI of making sure that we work on those campaigns because it'll only get more expensive to our society if we don't figure that out. So that's work that we still all have to do together in so many different parts of our community and our planet. Uh, the last thing we always do is a customary thing for our Rotary Club is that, as you heard Sally talk about our international campaign to eradicate polio across the planet, we do this for every guest speaker is that we donate 100 doses of polio vaccine in your honor, just in the standpoint of having you present. And this is our initial program for Sally's year, and I think you hit a home run. I just want to let you know that. I feel deeply honored and very grateful for that. Uh, thank you for doing that. I, uh, it um, means a lot to me. Thank you again. Yeah, and if you could, if you can stay on for some questions after we adjourn, I think we have a few more business items, right, Sally? We do. I can okay. be with you till half past the hour then on a different Zoom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Berwick. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, Hans. And now I'd like to turn this over to Bill Anderson, who will be reintroducing Gordon Gam in a blue, red to blue badge transition. Great. Uh, if I could have Fred start the, the slide, thank you. It is my honor to reintroduce Gordon Gam, who after years as an esteemed honorary member joined Boulder Rotary Club officially in October last year, sponsored by Deborah Kelly. Gordon's career and life span multiple states and multiple in industries and include a plethora of good works for a myriad of nonprofit organizations. Here are just a few details about his life and a bit about his mind and heart. Gordon is a retired attorney, an active investor, a humanist philanthropist, and an author who lives in Boulder with his wife, Grace. Grace also is a Boulder Rotary Club member. Gordon was born in Louisiana, majored in philosophy at Drake University, received his law degree from Tulane University, and 20 years later also received a PhD in communication science from Kansas University. A man of many interests and hobbies, music has always held a special place in Gordon's heart. He started piano lessons at age five or six and plays by ear. He was the first chair trumpet player in the high school band and also student conductor. Gordon and Grace are ardent supporters of a number of music related causes in the Boulder area, including the University of Colorado College of Music, the Dairy Center, where two renovated theaters bear their names, the Boulder Philharmonic, and the Colorado Music Festival. Gordon has said that to live life without art is to have a lifeless experience that could be duplicated by machines. Gordon is the founder of the Boulder International Humanist Institute and says the common thread in his humanist philanthropy is a sense of justice for all. He devotes himself to causes that ring true to his humanist ideals, including bringing interdisciplinary studies to CU's Boulder's CU Boulder's College of Arts and Sciences, addressing food insecurity among local school children in partnership with the Boulder Valley School District, making it possible for low-income parents to send their children to daycare, working with Planned Parenthood to create, create a judicial bypass program staffed with volunteer lawyers to aid pregnant teens who are afraid to seek parental consent for abortions, and a scholarship program with I Have a Dream to incentivize young people to stay in college. Asked about his experience of Boulder Rotary Club, Gordon said, I believe that Rotary provides the best opportunity for those of us fortunate enough to have time or discretionary wealth to give back to our community or our world for the good fortune of our lives. So much of our life success is attributable to the luck 
we had of being born to loving and caring parents. I am glad to enjoy the company and friendship of successful Rotary members who share my hope for a better and more peaceful world. There are so many ways we can learn about our community and contribute to a better community. I have had the opportunity to create programs to meet unmet needs where I get the best bang for my bucks through Rotary. After having the privilege of being an honorary member for years, it is an honor to become a regular Blue Badge member. Congratulations, Gordon, on your transition from Red Badge to Blue Badge member of the Boulder Rotary Club. Thank you, Bill. Hi, Gordon. We sure are proud to have you as a member. We're, we're very lucky to have you. Um, now we have the Boulder Rotary Update, otherwise known as the Brew. I made that. All right, all right, all right. Starting off the new year with Danny Lindau. You are at the base. <laughs> <laughs> you are at the best place to be on a Friday afternoon here at Boulder Rotary. July is New Leadership Month at Boulder Rotary. Thank you in advance to the officers and the board of directors. And thank you, Sally Brown. Well, that pretty much kills the tradition of making fun of the current president on the MP4, but there are past presidents. And thank you to Bob Kemp, our new district governor from Denver Mile High Club. And to our area governor, Mr. Mike, I love Daryl Brown, Brady. Ugh, it's bloody hot. And the forecast for this weekend is bloody hot. Impact on Education has planned a virtual fundraising event to benefit Crans to Calculators. The virtual event will take place on August 6th from 7 to 8 p.m. The one-hour fundraiser will include entertainment and a live auction. Boulder Rotary has reserved a virtual table and is looking for members to help fill our table. Please contact Don James or Larry Johnson. Congratulations to our award winners announced last week. First off is the environment, which is now a new Rotary area of focus. Second is Anne-Marie Reeder. She is the quiet hero. Quick Start Award, Bill Anderson. That's a good looking couple right there. And the President's Discretionary Award goes to the World Community Service Team. And the Theme Award of Connects the World goes to our awesome Vroom Committee Team. Humanitarian Award goes to Jancy Campbell. And playing the role of Lifetime Achiever is Carol Griever. Service Above Self is Kitty DeKiefer. And our Rotarian of the Year went proudly to Mike Brady. Congratulations to all award winners. Well, and light news weeks equal long vignettes. Rotary! Rotary! Woo! What's up, lady? I gotta talk to that man down the end. The one in the black hat. Hey! Lady here wants to talk to the guy in the black hat. Hey, fella! You in the hat! The lady down the end wants to see you. What does she want? What does she want? What do you want? Tell him! I want to fill my life with service above self. I love humanity. I love helping. I love you. I love She loves Rotary. Well, tell her. Tell her. Tell her to join the club. We really want to implore all Rotary members to please, please keep wearing your mask. Ralphie's doing it, and Paul Harris is doing it. Stay cool, Rotarians, and everybody have, have a, a great, great weekend. weekend. Thank you for that great video, Daryl Brown.
So when we were in person, we all sit at a birthday table during our birthday month, and it's an opportunity for the rest of the club to get us to get to know us a little bit better. And so I'm going to turn this over to George Russell, who will introduce a few people. Well, uh, Monda Green, see my own. Yeah, Monda Green is a word that means a misunderstanding of the words, especially of uh, lyrics of the poems and songs. For example, Elton John's Tiny Dancer was thought to be, by many to be a song about Tony Danza. Creedence Clearwater Revival uh, song, There's a Bad Moon on the Rise, a lot of people would sing, There's a Bathroom on the Right. There are hundreds of these, and many of you know your own Monda Green. My favorite is John Prine, who was asked to sing the half a enchilada song. The actual words were, that's the way the world goes round. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. You're in a half an inch of water and you think you're gonna drown. So there you are, people uh, hear and sing what they think the words are. The word was co coined by a US writer and humorist, Sylvia Wright who as a child was read poetry by her mother. And she loved a poem that went, ye highlands, ye lowlands, oh, where hey ye been? They've slain the Earl of Moray and the Lady Mon de Green. Only after she was older and read the poem herself, uh, she realized that there was no lady involved, that they had slain the Earl of Moray and laid him on the green. Sylvia Wright persisted that her version was much more dramatic. We have a, a person who wants to say some words to uh, Carol Griever. You have, uh, could you unmute your mic and say some words to us? I just wanted to say thank you again to the club for this huge honor that, that I just received. Um, I still can't believe it, but thank you again. Um, and I will um, celebrate another birthday tomorrow, um, actually Monday. Um, and I intend to make this next year a much more active one again in Boulder Rotary. Thank you so much. Well, uh, happy birthday, everyone. Be sure to let me know and if you want to say some words next time and all the people that were uh, born in July. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. There are many, many guests. Um, I'd like to give a special thank you to Daryl Brown, the past president greeter, Chad Stam with the pledge and four-way test, meeting management specialist, Fred Holt, Bill Anderson, the red badge chair, Cassidy Murphy for helping to keep me organized and a million other things this week. Mike Brady for helping to organize the Zoom chat questions. Gary Kahn for bringing us this wonderful speaker and moderating the questions. Hans Wick for responding today. And thank you to everyone who had a, play, a part to play in putting this all together. And there were so many. Oh, so stay cool out there, stay safe and have a great weekend. Uh, we are gonna uh, have opportunity to uh, chat with um, Dr. Berwick for a few minutes if you'd like to stay after. <laughs> if you have a question, you can, uh, why don't you just unmute yourself and ask it and if we get co conflicts, we'll call on you. Gary, I had a question, Ms. Gordon. Go ahead, Gordon. Um, you indicated that early childhood um, experience has a dramatic impact on, on uh, inequities and uh, the impact on, on people's lives. And my question is, uh, what is your impression about demonizing uh, access to contraceptives and abortion? It seems that 
most women that have abortions already have children and that they uh, want to be able to afford to take care of the children they already have. And I wonder how, how, how much that contributes to ch children being born to parents that resent them, don't love them, and don't have the resources to provide for them. Uh, it seems like uh, demanding that women be treated as criminals and put in jail for having abortion seems uh, like a, a poor solution for uh, for this I issue of early childhood development. What what's your opinion about that? Thanks for the question. I um, I mean I I regard it fundamentally as an issue of, of women's rights and uh, and uh, perhaps I can best. Um, Address your question by with a, with a positive uh, word. We, what we know is that um, children who experience uh, any of a series of what are called toxic stresses—that's another term for adverse childhood experiences—have much poorer health, much poorer educational outcomes uh, as children, and much poorer health and well-being as adults. Uh, but we also know that intervention in early childhood to support uh, families and kids works. Um, you all know the Head Start program, which has been studied very deeply. And um, we, um, we know that reaching out to families that are under great economic stress or uh, other forms of disadvantage uh, to help them build supports for kids, uh, helping the kids helps. Helping the parents and the kids helps even more. And so it's a really interesting finding that when you're able to help work on the kind of relationships you're talking about, Gordon, where you're, you're, you're uh, supporting, especially in single parent environments, mothers or fathers or single parents to, to, uh, to, to address both their own parenting needs and their own, their own needs for work and food security and self-esteem, things get a lot better. So whatever has set up any of the internal conflicts that you're talking about, attributing in your case uh, to demonizing abortion, uh, this, is, this is remediable by compassion and proper scientifically grounded programs of outreach to families, uh, in, uh, especially families in, in, in poverty. Um, that really works. You know, for uh, the, 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 I don't know about evidence about children who who were born despite their mother's wishes um, and the prevalence of stresses in kids. But I, I, I do know that it's possible to really support families to take, to take, to, to give the kids the love they really want to give them uh, once they're born. By the way, you, you, I think you all probably know that Denver has been the home of some of the best research on uh, child well-being uh, in the world. And so you're very close to one of the real intellectual centers to address the kinds of concerns that Gordon's talking about. Yeah, the Kemp Center. Right. The Kemp Center. Yeah. So uh, George, uh, Germany, you had a question. Did you, are you still here? Okay, I think we've lost George. Uh, anybody else have a question? We have a couple more minutes. Gary, Bill Anderson's, Bill Anderson's wife had a question okay. in the chat, um, and I can read it uh, if they are out and about. Um, Dr. Berwick, given the increase in life expectancy, do you consider raising the age of Medicare eligibility as a viable solution to the dire financial situation? Uh, I, I saw the question earlier, but I guess Bill's wife's name is Jamie. So um, I understand the logic behind it, but uh, I actually have the, the opposite recommendation. Um, first of all, just financially, Medicare is, a, is overall a less expensive way to secure uh, health care for people. Uh, it, because it does administrative pricing and has programs on price controls, uh, Medicare actually gets a better deal than commercial insurance. So if you adopted Jamie's idea and had people move from Medicare back to commercial coverage, costs would go up, not down. Uh, and so I, uh, the opposite is true if you lower the Medicare age. 
And that would be where I would come down on it. I think that lowering the age of eligibility to Medicare, so let's say people 60 years of age could buy in or 55, uh, I think that would have wholly favorable effects. Uh, first of all, people would then have much more secure coverage because if they lose their jobs, they still have coverage. Uh, they would have um, the, the benefits of the, of the pricing and economics of Medicare, which are more favorable than commercial insurance. And the employers would have break because they would either, if they continue to subsidize coverage, would, have, would be able to get coverage for their employees at a lower cost, essentially buy into Medicare costs, or if, if, if they, that meant the employer was completely relieved of coverage, the person would have other, would seek other ways to cover themselves. So I think on the whole, I, I prefer expanding, not contracting Medicare. In fact, as I told you earlier, I've come over, after really quite a bit of thinking and a long journey to sort of think the best option of all for the country, if we could do it, would be national health insurance or Medicare for, it wouldn't be Medicare for all exactly because you couldn't, Medicare isn't fit for, its benefit structure isn't right for younger people totally should have to, but, but, but a national health insurance program would, would be, um, I think the best solution of all, plus save a ton of administrative nonsense uh, that comes with a very uh, complex payment system. I'm with you, Dr. Berwick. Although my wife asks, why do the commercial plans do a better job at managing costs though? And they I don't. think that may no, have no, been the other part way. of yeah, I, I, I must have said it wrong. The commercial plans don't. Medicare does a better job at managing costs. That's a little bit because it, it, it can set prices. Medicare determines what price it'll pay. Commercial plans negotiate those prices with providers. But overall, the Medicare prices are favorable compared to, to um, commercial, which, and ask a hospital leader, they'll tell you that's a problem because Medicare pays them less than the commercial insurers do. And that's a big area of debate. But no, I know the costs have risen faster on the commercial side than on the Medicare side by quite a bit. I have a question related to that, uh, Dr. Berwick. Um, it, you know, as you mentioned, we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world. And other than the very rich uh, who can afford their own doctors and so on, we get very poor results. Uh, yet that money washing through the system creates its own inertia uh, to reform. Could you comment on the variable of money and power? And, and that's across the vast healthcare system that we have uh, as a barrier to a more rational, cost efficient and effective healthcare system? Yeah, thanks, uh, Meryl. Um, okay, so we are very, very expensive, uh, nearly double the next most expensive country, which is Switzerland. So uh, Switzerland's at about maybe 12% of its GDP, we're at 18%. Uh, Switzerland is the second highest rated uh, healthcare system in the world, uh, according to WHO, or was recently. It's got the second highest life expectancy, I believe, in the world. Close. Japan is the number one. I think Switzerland's close to number two. We're 40th. Uh, so we're spending nearly double the money for much poorer results. So Merrill's premise is exactly right. The, 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 the way we do that is to waste a ton. And uh, the w I've written a paper in 2012, which I'd be happy to share with you on the sources of waste, but there are six that I can tell you. One is um, we overuse. Because we pay fee-for-service care, we do lots of stuff that doesn't help at all. Uh, extra visits, extra tests, even extra surgeries that other countries don't do. They're not needed. They don't help. But we do them because the incentives, it's not like evil. It's not like doctors do it kind of have a plot to overuse, but the psychology is toward overuse. Second, we have problems of coordination of care because we, we pay in fragments. We don't build across boundaries. And so if you have chronic illness, good luck to you because you're going to be seeing many, many different clinicians and they aren't going to be part of the same system usually. Uh, there are differences. Kaiser Permanente, for example, is an integrated system, but that's not the usual system in our country. Third, we have problems in care, quality of care, like uh, injuries to patients in hospitals or uh, 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 mistakes in care. Those are very expensive. Fourth is administrative costs. We are way, way above any other country on administrative costs. They amount to at least 15, probably closer to 20% of the total bill. And that's paperwork. That's all the coding and paper shuffling you see with different provide, different uh, insurers using different different forms, different coding systems. Oh, it's, it's, it's terrible. I ran Medicare. Our overhead rate was was it was 1%, but probably was a little, that was a little undercounting. I sometimes think it was closer to 2 or 3%. Overhead rates for commercial insurers are 15% or 
So, so <coughs> that's a lot of waste. Um, and then uh, there is some fraud, uh, not, not a little bit of fraud in healthcare. Very few people do it, but it's there. And then there's also costing problems, which it, it, it's hard to explain in, in a short time, but basically we don't have anything like competitive costing which is why you see these drug prices go up and up and up. Insulin, the cost of insulin has gone up every quarter. This is a old drug. I mean, we've had it for years. It just keeps going up and up and up because nobody stops it. There's no competitive force to stop it. You saw the prices that were there for hepatitis drugs. And now uh, Gilead is going to make the drug remdesivir, which is some effect, a possibly effect on COVID. They've just priced that drug at uh, I think it's uh, nearly three thousand three thousand uh, dollars just because they can do it. So we have a lot of problems that add extra cost to the to the system, and that makes us very very wasteful. Anybody else have a burning question? Like Don, uh, yeah, this is Hans again. You know, one of the things, and I know you read some of the same stuff I do with the Tolgawande's work, but we really do have a impending crisis in long-term care and the cost of dementia and Alzheimer's and we do. most people aren't prepared for it. And that all hits the Medicaid bucket. I mean, what are we going to have to do as a country to figure that out? Because oh. I don't think we know the true cost of what that's going to cost us. It's massive, Hans. It's already costing us. I mean, the, the costs are enormous. We do not have a systematic approach to care of elders, uh, let alone demented elders. Um, I, I, again, I don't want to be glib about it, but it's because we don't have a healthcare system. There's nobody, Hans has asked a fabulous question. Who's supposed to answer it? Who's responsible for saying, here's the American approach to managing uh, the surge of uh, baby boomers like me who are gonna enter as uh, more and more uh, elderly and, and with more and more demands on, on long-term care and on behavioral health and on de dementia care. We don't have any responsibility for that. Uh, take, for example, other countries that have a different view of healthcare, where they treat it as a human right. They say we have as a public, we have a public duty to assure it. Uh, I was in Taiwan uh, to, uh, last year, the year before or last, uh, where the keynote address, I gave a keynote, but the other keynote address at our meeting was the uh, Minister of Health in Taiwan, who, or, excuse me, the Vice President of Taiwan, who is a physician, an epidemiologist. And he gave a lecture on Taiwan's plan for elder care. And Hans, I just, I wish you'd been there. I mean, it was a systematic five part plan for investment of the nation in the supports and well being of elders, both healthy elders and frail elders. It, there's a plan uh, at a national level. Uh, in the UK, which is uh, its own, has its own problems, of course, but there is a health service that plans uh, the same in Scotland, the same in Denmark. And so we, um, we haven't in this country, because, I think because we haven't made healthcare a universal human right with public stewardship, we don't have the planning functions available to us. And I think that creates great weakness. If we did, it's, we're not solved. The, the technical issues are very, very serious. What, what would an ideal system be? I'll, I'll clue you in, IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which I used to run and where I'm senior fellow now, has a wonderful program called, um, called Age-Friendly Healthcare. It was funded by the John A. Hartford Foundation. It's free, you get online, just go to IHI.org, put in age-friendly, and there's a whole beginning network now. We have hundreds of hospitals around the country and health systems now networked together to work on what it would like to be age, what it would be to be age-friendly, including some of the, uh, the, the uh, some serious forms of, of, uh, of frail elder care that, that Hans is raising. Age-friendly healthcare, I, I, I urge you to Google it. Great, because I think most people don't understand that as they think Medicaid is just basically for health care, 40% of every Medicaid dollar goes to long-term care. Yeah, and That's going to get worse, and we all pay for that. So I think you're absolutely correct. We have to have a national policy. There is no long-term care insurance. Everybody who has all their assets that are eaten up then end up in Medicaid, and we all pay for it. Exactly right. And the states, of course, bear a tremendous burden of that. Right is they're paying half, you know, a significant portion of the Medicaid costs. Well, it looks like we arrived at the time that you, I've got a pumpkin. We, yeah. we promised, <laughs> we promised <laughs> we to say goodbye. So thank you again so thank much, Dr. Berwick. Thanks. It was just fantastic. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure to be with you and I hope to visit you in person sometime soon. Thank you. Well, we thank, you. So thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.